Hey everyone, it's Kate, and today I'm interviewing Nancy Nix Rice, the author of Looking Good Every Day and an expert on clothing color, silhouettes, and style. March is It's a Colorful Life Month at the Confident Stitch, so I'm really excited to interview Nancy. I also interviewed Chris Mila Dragovich to talk about colors in quilting, and I'll include a link to that video. So one of the most, I think, innovative things we do at the Confident Stitch is our swatch service. And I know you can't see this perfectly, but if you subscribe to the clothing aspect of our swatch service, you can get either a warm tone card or a cool tone card. And each card you'll have, I'm upside down, there we go, eight, uh, you get eight, swatches of fabric that are good for those color tones they're good for the season and they kind of go together as a capsule wardrobe um, underneath each fabric we have um, ways to care for it what needle to use some tips and tricks for sewing with it and then we also pair each fabric with a different um, pattern it's a great way for us to bring the store to you, but it can be challenging to decide whether you want the cool tone or the warm tone or both. And that is why I invited Nancy to talk to us about deciding what tones will look best on you and how to use your skin tone and your hair color to decide what colors to wear. So welcome, Nancy, and I know you've created a wonderful PowerPoint for us, and I am just invite you to take it away. Thanks, Kate. I really appreciate the invitation. Obviously, this is my favorite thing to talk about, so <laughs> looking forward to it. So let's just launch right into the slides. Awesome. Rachel is taking care of the slide turning for us. There we go. How lovely to have a professional assistant. I'm used to having to juggle all of that myself. I know. It's, it's a luxury that I love. Well, there's no doubt that because we sew all or some of our own clothing, we have so much more flexibility than people who buy all their clothes and are limited to what any given store or designer is featuring at any given time. But sometimes all that flexibility um, can lead us down the primrose path if we're not really sure what's going to be the most flattering for us. It's not as much fun um, to do all that sewing work and then not be happy with it. So I'd like to focus on how much difference does color make and how do we be sure that we're on the right side of that equation. Color, the colors that we are really are the foundations for the choices that we're going to make. And it's almost it's almost impossible to overstate how much difference the colors we surround ourselves with make in how wonderful the colors that we are appear. I love this little optical illusion because even if you totally know if your intellectual brain is quite willing to accept that in each pair, those center colors are the identical shade, they look so different based on what they're surrounded by that you almost can't convince yourself that those two purples in the top right, for instance, are really the same color. And it makes the same sort of difference in us. So let's take a look at three of my previous clients and how much difference right colors make on them. I'm starting out with all three of them draped in a black and white zebra print. And I chose that print for a starting point for two reasons. Number one, because so much of garment retail and the fashion um, editorial departments spend on convincing us that black and white is what everyone should wear. Right. When 
when as a matter of fact, it's probably the most challenging color combination for anyone to be flattered by. That's not to say it doesn't flatter anyone, but it is certainly not the universal answer um, that we're told that it is. And we're especially told that if we want to build an interchangeable mix and match capsule wardrobe. So let's start with Sherry on the left. At the by the way, these are all real people that I've worked with. Um, some of them are personal friends. And I want you to know that between the before picture and the after picture, I didn't change any factor except the colors that you'll see them surrounded by. I didn't change their makeup. I didn't touch up their hair. I don't have the skills to do that if I had wanted to. Mm -hmm. So the, the difference that you'll see between how stressed and drained Sherry looked before and how glowing and healthy she looks now is absolutely nothing. Oh, thanks for backing up because that is such a dramatic change. Um, and it's nothing but the colors that she's surrounded by. Now, rather than draping these examples in solid colors for you, I've chosen multicolor patterned drapes for the simple reason that most people who are not trained as professional color consultants see the differences much more dramatically when it's a color combination rather than just two different single colors. I'm not especially advocating for more prints in your wardrobe. Most of us as sewers tend to overdo a little bit in that direction anyway. Um, but I just want you to see the color differences. Now, when you look at Marcy in the middle, you actually might think that that black and white color scheme could work on her. And it does come the closest. Why? Because her hair is almost a sparkly silver white and her eyes are really dark. So the lights and darks in that zebra print have something to relate to about her. But when you look at Marcy's face, can we back up one sec? to see, yeah, when you look at Marcy's face before, I want you to think where your attention dominantly goes, which of her features is commanding your attention. And nearly everyone in my live classes tells me that they're really noticing her nose. Now, noses yeah. are fine. We all have them. We'd look silly without them. But watch when we put her in better balanced colors. And do you see how now you're not especially focused on her nose at all, but instead you're way more inclined to focus on her eyes, to make eye contact with her, if you will, and with all the relational implications that that eye contact has. Now, Kim, our third model, is fine in black because her hair is black or very close to it. So it's repeating something about her, but the high contrast of that bright white still is pulling all our attention away from her face. Now, when we move to the after picture, I want you to especially notice her lips and cheeks. And remember, I didn't touch up her makeup in any way, but do you see all of a sudden, wow. Isn't that amazing yeah. how her cheeks look rosier, her lips are more colorful. And, and again, all your attention goes to her. And that's what we want. It's not our job to make clothes look good. It's mm -hmm. clothes job to make us look good. And oh, that's so great. That, that's a great quote, color. Nancy. Thanks. You're welcome to steal it anytime. <laughs> Awesome. Absolutely. Anytime. And frankly, I stole it from a client. We were shopping and she was having a very, she was a ready to wear buyer and she was very frustrated with the selection that she was finding. And that's, that's when she made that comment that she was the one presenting her credit card. It was the clothes job to make her look good. Yeah. So let's take a look at how we make those good, um, color decisions when we're shopping ourselves. 
First, I want you to shift your color paradigm just a little bit because we seem to all have a tendency to think about color in what I call the eight crayon box mode, which mm -hmm. means if I say red, you think an apple or a fire truck. If I say blue, you think royal blue. If I say green, you think Kelly green. And I want you to realize that there are literally countless variations on every color in the rainbow. And we're not even going to try to put names to all of them because they wouldn't the names wouldn't mean the same thing to any two of us. So we're going to look at color characteristics and use that as our guideline for pointing each of you toward the things that are the most likely to be flattering. Fair enough? Yeah, that's a great, that's great. Okay. As, as an example of the diversity that we mean, my next slide shows you the range of colors from the red family that I use when I'm doing a color consultation wow. with a, an individual client. So red, again, is not just apples and fire trucks. It's literally hundreds of variations. And of course, the same thing is true of the green color family and the blue color family and the neutrals in every color category. There are countless choices. Now, how do we narrow them down for each individual? So let's take that process step by step. Typically, the first thing that we talk about when we are trying to align a person and her most effective colors is what we call color temperature. And people have color temperature and fabrics and clothing have color temperature. And what we mean by that is the presence or absence of goldenness, golden pigment, that we see in the person's color elements and that we see in the colors in a fabric, a print, a garment, whatever. Now, it's really typical to talk about color temperature as a simple binary. Either someone is cool or they're warm. The truth of the matter is, like almost every human characteristic, color temperature exists on a continuum from the very warmest people to the pretty warm people to the people who are right on the fence and then on over to the cool side. So your personal color temperature might land anywhere along that continuum. In my example, of course, to make it easy for you to see and understand the difference, I chose two women who are on the extremes and then somebody who's toward the middle. So our gal on the left has very peachy colored skin. She has golden green eyes and auburn hair. Each of those elements has golden pigment making it up. And so she's someone that we would classify as being distinctly warm. Surely the woman on the right is just the opposite. Her hair is silvery. Her skin is more of a pinky base. Her eyes are a clear blue. So nothing about her has any goldenness. So of course, we're going to classify her as cool. And then our lady in the middle is one of countless different kinds of color patterns that would be somewhere in the midpoint. So if you look, obviously with blonde hair, there's an element of goldenness to that. But also notice that her hair isn't a real golden blonde, it's more ash blonde. So that's an, an indication of middleness. Her eyes are blue, distinctly cool. Her skin is fairly neutral, not overly pink or overly peachy. So again, that puts her right in that middle range. So what does it mean for a color to be a warmer or cooler variation of its eight crayon box color name, if you will? So in this slide, I started on the right-hand side with a decidedly cool 
pink. We're looking at sort of that pink into coral into peachy range of the red family. So totally cool. And then as I added the bars consecutively from right to left, I just worked with the color palette built right into PowerPoint and moved mm -hmm. one step warmer and another step warmer and another step warmer as we move from right to left. So that should be a pretty easy understanding of warm to cool. And now maybe you're thinking about why I asked you to let go of the eight crayon box um, terminology for color, because by the time we get over to those warmest reds, we're putting our toe into the orange range of the color wheel, aren't we? And yeah. that's always going to happen because a true complex color wheel isn't just the primary colors and secondary colors, but all kinds of variation. And each color family blends into its next door neighbor. The important thing is that we want to align the temperature, the degree of goldenness in a person's coloring with the degree of goldenness in the colors that they choose to wear, regardless of the color family that they're pulled from. So can we move to the next slide and see our ladies aligned more or less? This isn't a calibrated alignment, but can you see how our very warm lady obviously looks much more at home in those very warmer reds trending toward orange? And now try to envision her over there in those pinks on the right hand side. And it's almost like fingernails on a blackboard. And similarly, if we took Shirley, our cool example on the far right, and tried to put her in those orangey coppery reds, it would just be a total disconnect because we always look the best in things that repeat the characteristics that are inherent to us. And color temperature is one of those characteristics. We see our next slide or question. Oh, no, I just um, I, I'm following you. OK, mm -hmm. um, one last quick comment is that like most things in the natural world, people's characteristics and all kinds of other things too, color temperature and also the value and intensity that we'll look at as we move forward tend to assort on a bell curve. So there's a real likelihood that a lot more of us are somewhere in that middle range. And these extreme examples like our very, very warm lady and our very, very cool lady are very noticeable. They really catch our attention, but they're not as prevalent as the people in the middle which of course, in terms of subscribing to the swatch service from the Confidence Stitch, um, might be a hint that if you are not sure about your color temperature um, and therefore think you might be in the middle, you're the prime person to simply get both sets of swatches. Right, Great Kate? suggestion, excellent, excellent idea. All righty, let's move into our next color characteristic, which is the element of value. Now, when we talk about, when we use the word value, talking about color, that doesn't mean a monetary value. It doesn't mean that one kind of color is better than another. It simply means the light to dark element of both colors and people. And for us as human beings, our color value is determined by, if you want to think of it in mathematical terms, it's sort of the average visual weight of our hair color, our skin color, and our eye color. But honestly, your eyes count a little bit less because they're just a lot less real estate when someone is looking at you um, than your skin and your hair are likely to be. But I've arranged this whole montage of ladies on 
just sort of a generalized continuum from people with very light, airy, pale color values along the left-hand side through progressively stronger color values across the middle to really strong color values on the right-hand end. And I think that, that that progression is pretty easy to see. And we can do the same thing with colors. So let's take a look at what that might look like. And I'm betting that that's going to look pretty familiar to most people simply because if you've ever wanted to paint your bedroom or paint your kitchen a new color, when you head out to the hardware store, all the, the color strips of the colors that they can mix for you in paint are typically arrayed on a value continuum a lot like this one. And again, the idea here is that we want to match up more or less in a general way, match up the color value of a person with the color value of the colors that are going to be the most flattering for them, at least as their, their primary head to toe kinds of colors. So let's see how those line up for our assortment of ladies. And once again, can you imagine how overpowering our pale color value gals on the left would look if we put them over in those darker, stronger colors on the right? And conversely, how out of balance our stronger color value people would look if we put them head to toe in those pale, frothy, airy, lightweight, visually lightweight colors on the left. And when we make that mistake, we get this really odd effect um, that I call the floating head effect. And I believe mm -hmm. our next slide has some examples of floating heads. Mm -hmm. And what it means to be a floating head is that there's no visual flow or connection between the clothes and the person. So let's start with the example on the left. And this one always makes me chuckle. It's taken from one of the very prominent fashion magazines. Um, this is an actress, Kristen Wiig is her name. And this is taken from an article about the fact that she had gotten finally a new stylist and how much better she was looking. Unfortunately, what they were so glowing about was the outfit on the right, where there is absolutely no visual connection between the color that she's wearing head to toe and her head. So do you see how you almost feel like there's a dotted line across her shoulders? It's it's just so jarring. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that she couldn't wear that color very successfully as a shell. Let's think if she had that on with chocolate brown pants and maybe a chocolate cardigan thrown over it or tossed around her shoulders so that that blush color, which happens in her case to be a repeat of her skin tone, was just an accent, was creating some light, dark contrast like her personal color pattern. It could look great, but as a head to toe, it's just not making it. Right. Needless, needless to say, my second example is the former First Lady Michelle Obama. And one of my favorite photographs that I have ever seen of her is in that beautiful dark toned dress on the left. Not only is the dark tone very balanced to her color pattern, but I also love the fact that the shapes of the motifs in the print are sort of an echo of the swooshes that her hairstyle is making as well. It just showcases everything about her so beautifully. In the picture on the right, she's still a beautiful woman and it's a gorgeous dress, but do you see how the two just don't feel connected and how much the dress overpowers her and makes it really hard to focus on her face? Yeah. Just the opposite of what we want. 
Um, and then the example on the right is taken from a ready to wear catalog and it has the same thing on the example on the left. There's a great flow between the outfit and her, her face and her head. And on the right, all you can see is that dark, heavy outfit. And oh, my goodness, those exploding flowers or starbursts or whatever they are on those pants. So that's that's the floating head concept. And the answer is to to balance the color value of what you're wearing to the value of your own coloring. I think I have some more examples of this, too, if you want to fast forward for me. Um, here are our print dresses. And in this case, they're balanced to the color value of the women with whom they're aligned. But let's see what happens when we move to the next slide and see the lighter dress on the darker toned woman and the darker dress on the pale colored woman. And again, it's just that same disconnect. They're, the people are wonderful looking. The outfits might be just to your taste, but if the two don't line up, neither the outfit nor the person looks as good as it could. Yeah. So next. Now, a really interesting thing, and honestly, I did not figure this out until I was working with this particular program. But I've always been puzzled by how difficult it is to include darker color value coloring women in an explanation of warm and cool color temperature. And I finally realized it's because when either the person or a color moves into deeper, darker tones, all of a sudden the color temperature differences are much, much less noticeable. So I'm thinking that I know for me, when I look at the two reds or the two greens or the two teal blues or the two purples at their, their very deep color value, I am very hard pressed to tell you which one of those is warmer and which one of them is cooler. Kate, can you see how tricky that, that becomes? I, definitely, because um, on my screen, especially the teals and the purples look exactly the same. They look so alike. But then I took exactly those very same hues. I did not change the color in any way, but I just dialed back on the color value for this next slide. And do you see how as the color value comes back, now you are dials down, if you will. Now you can see greater levels of difference. I think you see it really, really clearly in the teal, really, really clearly in the purples. Yeah. So that's, it's not that women with stronger coloring don't still have color temperature. Of course they do, but it's not as visible in their own coloring, nor is it as visible in the deeper tones that are going to be the value match for them. Right. So an interesting nuance of color that I had never really articulated until I was getting ready for this workshop just <laughs> proved and it's an infinite, infinite topic. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about one more color characteristic, and that's the characteristic of intensity, which simply means how bright and strong someone's coloring is versus being a little more muted and softened and gentled down. And it's fun that we're a fabric group talking about this because in a recent, recent workshop, when we were trying to put words around why Marcy's coloring on the left is, is more intense and Shirley's is more gentle, what one of my participants said was, you know, it's like Marcy's coloring is satin, it's shiny and reflective, and Shirley's coloring is more like velveteen. It's just mm -hmm. sort of 
sort of softer. And isn't that cool how that that really um, sort of ties a bow on the difference that we mean when we talk about intensity? Yeah. And and intensity is one more characteristic where we want to find a balance between the person and the colors that we wear. And it's so ironic that women who have that gentle muted kind of coloring will say to me over and over and over that they feel like their coloring is so drab that they really need to wear bright, bright colors to brighten me up, but to brighten them up. Um, but guess what happens when you take that gentle coloring and put super bright colors on it? Is it going to be the woman wearing the clothes or is it going to be the clothes wearing the woman? It's right. ob obviously going to be that second one. So mm -hmm. let's look at how that translates into color choices for these women. Here are examples of three clear sort of pure pigment colors. And then below them, you see those very same hues, but softened in various ways. If you've ever uh, painted with oils or acrylics, you know that you don't go to the store and buy 80 different colors of paint to get the nuance that you want in your beautiful artistic composition. You buy just a few primary basic colors and mix them together to create the sophisticated color combination for a beautiful painting. In a similar way, when manufacturers are choosing the dye mixes or even if you're a, a do-it-yourselfer playing with dye at home, you know that you can add white or black or gray or yellow, camel, brown, um, or the color wheel opposite of a color. And any of those additions is going to tone down and make a more complex or muted version of that same color. And the idea is that women with really strong, intense, bright coloring look better in the clear colors and women whose coloring is a little more subdued and quiet look better in the quiet ones. And what I really want you to notice is that the quieter colors still look like energetic colors because not only are you seeing surely in the context of those colors, but you're seeing those colors in the context of Shirley and the balance is just wonderful. And she looks anything but drab and boring. Mm -hmm. And that applies not only to solid colors, but I think we have some patterned examples to look at really quick as well. And of course, there's my reminder that like every other characteristic, intensity assorts along a bell curve. Now let's look at our print combinations that I think, yeah, there they are. So if you were just going to use basic words to describe these two little summer dresses, um, they're blue florals, that's really, an, or maybe multi-shades of blue florals. But can you see how the dress on the left is a more clear blue background? The darker blues are also more clear, not grayed down in any way. The areas of bright white and the black outlines all contribute to make that print read stronger than the one on the right. And so the strong one is obviously enough a better match for Marcy, our model on the left. The dress on the right is a more gray down shade of blue to start with. And then the motifs are smaller and their coloration is simply paler values of the background color. Um, and so they sort of just diffuse out into the background rather than standing away from it like the boulder print does. And all of those elements together make that a more muted print that's much better balanced to Shirley on the right. And if that's not quite resonating for any of you looking at this, I think in my next slide, I've reversed the ladies. So you can see how Shirley would be overpowered by that stronger print. The dress would be wearing her, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and Marcy's just kind of drabbed out by mm -hmm. the print 
on the right. So, and this is a very hard thing, I think, for us as women who sew, because prints are just so alluring on the bolt and they speak to us emotionally. Um, and often I find that people forget that, um, that they really need to look and say, how is this print going to work on me? And if it's not going to work on you, I will tell you one of my favorite tricks is if I just really love it, I'll just buy a quarter of a yard of it and put it into my fabric collection. And then once a year, when I go through and fold and organize everything, I can take it out, stroke it, admire it, and put it mm -hmm. away to play with it again next year. But <laughs> I'm sure not going to invest my precious sewing time making something for myself that I really know in my heart of hearts is not going to be my best choice. So let's see what our next slide. Ah, I get such a kick out of this slide the, because it really illustrates so clearly how the best colors for any woman look like her. And they look like her because they're the color temperature, the color value, and the color intensity that balances her coloring. So these are just four examples of past clients with their color fans next to them. And if you start from the top left, Nancy, this is another Nancy, not, not yours truly, um, <laughs> but her coloring is to the warm side. It's very rich, sort of deep and strong um, in that way. And fairly clear, but not super bright. And you can see how you would use those very same terms to describe her color fan. On the other hand, if you look at Linda in the bottom right, her coloring is just almost ethereal. It's so pale and soft, decidedly cool and not particularly intense. And when you look at her color fan, all those very same words apply. And I won't walk you through that same process with Anita on the top right or with Kim on the bottom left, but I'm hoping that by this time in the discussion, you can see those attributes aligning without my having to spell it out for you. Yes, um, so it looks, like, do you have everybody wearing gold except for the bottom right? Um, it does. Yes, that does happen. With Kim on the bottom left, her metallic that you're seeing reads gold in this slide, but it's actually a mix of gold and silver together because her coloring overall, as you can see from her color, color choices, choices. Is, is more to the cool side, but her physical skin tone has so much goldenness to it that the plain silver looked a little abrupt on her. The plain gold sort of muddied her skin tone and the gold silver mix was absolutely perfect. Yeah. Um, and it looks like um, the woman on the bottom right is the only one wearing black. Um, that actually isn't black. It's a deep, um, really deep gray blue because that's the color that matches her eyes. And then as mm. you about at um, 11 o'clock, maybe you'll see her quote dark neutrals, which are not terribly dark, but one of them is a, a little bit deeper version of her silvery gray hair tone. And the second one is a variation of navy blue that's a little more slate kind of blue, which mm. is actually the mm -hmm. paler color values of the really strikingly deep blue that her eye color is. You have a great perceptive eye for this. <laughs> Uh, not really, but um, I definitely need a professional's help like yours. So what about Kim in the bottom left? Is Does she have, is black okay for her to wear? Yes, black works fine on her because it's part of what she is. 
if there's sort of an umbrella concept that I use for every decision about what looks good on a person, both color wise, style wise, accessories, details, all of it. And it's what I call points of connection. And the idea of points of connection is that the more characteristics that exist in common between a person and the things that she chooses to wear, the more the whole thing is going to look better. The woman's going to look better and the stuff is going to look classier as well. And it's really the most basic of artistic principles, which is just the idea of repetition, that anything looks more right in a visual composition, the more often it's repeated. Like imagine the, the famous painting of, okay. of the sunflowers and think if we popped a red rose in there. Red roses are beautiful, but it wouldn't go at all with everything else that was happening. Make right. sense? Yeah. All right. Then I think I had just a couple of other um, little quick details. This is just talking about the fact that black is not the only neutral that we can use in our wardrobes and that most of the mythology that we're told about black isn't really true anyway. So our next slide shows you the kind of secret easy answer that almost everyone can figure out for themselves about identifying their best neutral. Here's this whole variety of different women um, who I have draped, if you will, in black. And do you see how for all but one of them, that black just really has nothing about their own appearance to grab onto. So let's get rid of those black drapes. And what you'll discover is that now every one of them is wearing a neutral that is in some way related to or a variation of her hair color. And it just makes each one of them look so much more balanced, so much more consistent between the outfit and themselves. And of course, it's only that top left-hand woman or almost the, the very center top woman who, because her hair is black or near black, gets a terrific balance from black. It's not that no one can do it. It's just not that it's the right choice for everyone. And that's, again, one of those points of connection that you can make by repeating what you intrinsically are. And I think we also have a look at um, skin tone as a neutral. Oops, a little aside. If someone who's watching this has, I'll back up and talk for just a second about that previous slide, if that's okay. Um, because almost invariably when people learn that black might not be their most basic, wonderful neutral, they're in a state of panic because they have a closet full of it. And one of the most effective ways to bridge those black garments that somebody already owns back to their own coloring is to add elements that repeat their hair color within the mix. So here we've put a shell under that black jacket that repeats the woman's hair color and then added either the scarf or the little clutch bag in the animal print that include both the black and that element of her own coloring to make the combination make sense. Now we can look at those white shirts um, because that's another thing that retail tells us over and over that classic bright white shirts are what we all must wear. But it's so easy to see from this example that, again, those are five white shirts wearing those women. And your attention almost has to struggle to get up to their faces. And it's only in the bottom right example where we've dialed back that brightness to some sort of softer, pale neutral that all of a sudden the woman starts showing up. And in the next slide, you'll see that this is another place that you can introduce an element of your own personal coloring. So Caucasian women 
look wonderful when instead as one alternative to that bright white, they pick up this soft blush color that's somewhere between a pink and a peach and just flows right into their skin tone. And obviously for darker toned women, they can do the very same thing. It's just going to be expressed in a color that matches or is a lighter version of their skin tone. Then it's worth a quick mention that the one universally flattering color family that everybody looks good in um, is the narrow wedge of the color wheel that is teal blue, turquoise, aqua, and bridging over into a really blue-toned jade kind of green. And obviously each person has her ideal color value and color intensity within this color family. However, it is such a flattering choice for almost everyone that even if you fudge a little bit out of your very optimal teal or turquoise, you're still going to look pretty darn good. And it's not, that's not the case just because it's my favorite color or mm. because I like it. I think our next slide shows you on the color, oops, well, I'll tell you that on the color wheel, um, that teal, blue, and jade green family is the color wheel opposite of most all of our human skin tones. And anytime you put mm. two opposite colors together, they brighten or intensify or enrich one another. So a great choice for just about everyone. Then okay. let's take a look at putting colors together um, because there's a really important rule about that, which is that you never want to wear colors in a combination that builds in more light dark contrast than we see in your personal color pattern. And that's your clue why these really strong black and white um, patterns or even a black pantsuit with a white shirt are so challenging for people to wear in a flattering way because nobody has that level of contrast in their personal coloring. And in any visual composition, our attention absolutely goes first to the area of highest light dark contrast. So it's very eye catching, but unfortunately in most circumstances, it's going to catch the eye to the item and not to the person who's wearing it. Now, of course, if the color areas are smaller, your eye is going to tend to blend them. So a little bitty black and white hound's tooth check isn't going to have the same impact that this zebra print does. And also when the fabric is a little bit sheer or has a more crepe-like surface texture. Those are other factors that can mitigate that excessive contrast level. But if you look at the, the um, other option on this slide, do you see how just by backing the black off to chocolate brown, just by ramping up the white a little to a sandy beige, how now it almost exactly matches the level of contrast between her hair and skin and showcases her much more effectively. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think that may be the last, oh, I was, was going to do a little quiz. This mm -hmm. was, this is a screenshot from one of my style school sessions. Style school is a four week, once a week, um, Zoom class that I've been teaching since the start of a pandemic to help people understand all the attributes of clothing and accessories that are flattering to them. And this particular class participant was really stumped about color. So she went out in her yard and took pictures of herself in what 10 different things from her wardrobe and asked my advice about which ones of them were most flattering, but then we used it for the whole group to do the same exercise. So maybe I can, Kate, put you on the spot a little bit, um, but if there were a couple of these 
shirts that she's modeling that just immediately say to you, oh, no, that's way too bright for her. Which ones are you going to yeah. be? So, right away? Yeah. So on the top row, the bright pink one. Yeah, that's, that's the one that's in from the right is it. too much. And then the yellow one on the bottom row, I think I can see it and not her. Yep. Those were exactly the first two that I would have a problem with. And then there's one that has a definite color value mismatch that's way too pale and soft for her. And that's going to be that one on the bottom well, right. Mm-hmm. And then right. the combination yeah. in the middle of the top row where she has that really pale jacket over the, the darker shirt, that's going to be more light, dark contrast than she has going on. So do you see how right. some, e either certainly holding the, the item up to you or doing photographs so you have a little more distance and therefore a little more objectivity makes it surprisingly easy to see which things are have potential and which things are definite no's. And then the next slide shows you one of my personal favorite. Oh, these are some examples. Of, hey, Nancy, uh, let's go back to the previous one and talk about which sure. ones look best on her. Okay. So... Um, does the green one, is it the green one in the top left? Do you, is that one of the best ones? Yep, absolutely. Because it's deep and rich like her coloring is and not overly warm or cool. So that's one really mm -hmm. great choice. And the red one next to it is is also a really nice balance for her. Yeah. The royal blue on the end of that row isn't bad, but I'd like it more if it had either a little more warmth, if it was inching just a little bit toward teal, or if it was just a little darker. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's by no means as bright and jarring as the pink next to it, but it's not quite mountaintop for her. <laughs> right. And then on the bottom row, typically I would think that a navy and white polka dot would be problematic for her because it would be too much contrast. But do you see how in this example, either those dots are really tiny or they're a lovely, very off, off white, or maybe the edges of the mm -hmm. dots are irregular. So, but for whatever reason, they're not popping out in the way that I would have thought that they yeah. would. So I think that's a pretty good choice. It's hard to get a yeah. really good look at the two prints in the middle of that bottom row. But if you were seeing them in a little bit of an enlarged view, both of them are very, very, very busy. And so they they are almost like static on an old TV screen after the station signed off um, and and really can, uh -huh. can distracting. Right. Okay, good. But, Thanks. And then one of the things that we also do in the style school is I get all of the participants to send me photos and we go through and, and look at color combinations in prints that look really good on them. And one of the great advantages of spotting one or two prints that really showcase you is that then you can spin the colors out of the print into solid pieces and have an automatic capsule wardrobe. Because if the print flatters you and you like how the colors in the print work together, that that just take so much of the guesswork out of how they would work together in a coordinated wardrobe and how well each of those individual colors would um, would flatter you. And, and that's, one, that's, 
Go ahead. Well, that, that's exact. That's exactly how um, Chris Miladragovich did um, with the the quilting cotton. She suggested starting mm -hmm. with a, a print that you really like, and then pulling colors out of it to build your quilt. And so you know you might end up not even using the original print in your quilt, but it it's a great way to um, combine colors that will look good in a quilt. So it's it's great that you have the same suggestion for our clothing. Yep, it certainly makes it easier than trying to dream up a color scheme out of the phrase that keeps hopping into my mind is to out of whole cloth, which sounds like like the worst pun <laughs> in the world. But I, um, I think it's fun. I, I love on the far right, Lonnie has that print that has the very, very, very darkest browns in it. And then that blush color that's like her skin tone and the lighter, the darkest browns are echoing her hair and the mid browns are echoing her eye color. So in every way, it's all about what she looks like. And if you look at Anita on the far left, not only, again, there are colors in there that are like her hair color, colors in there that are like her skin tone color, uh, but also notice the shapes of those ferns in the print. And what about her is that repeating? Mm -hmm. It's repeating her hair shapes, of course. Like her hair. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So again, the more different attributes of you that the colors and the fabrics and the clothing that you choose can be repeating, the more fabulous you'll look and the more fabulous the fabric, the garment, the whole wardrobe will look because it's all about what you're all about. And I think I have one more slide example of women from my class, um, again, in fabrics that repeat elements of them and and just how right they look and then how easy it would be to spin those colors out into a mix and match wardrobe. Yeah. So so tell us more about your class, your Zoom class that people can take. Well, th that has been so much, so much fun. I have had people tell me for ages that I should teach that class online, but I guess I just have a persecution complex and couldn't give up loading my car and driving all around the country and <laughs> schlepping stuff. Um, but really the reason that I never wanted to do it online was that I really like personalizing it for the people in the class and being able to, um, work from what they're actually wearing and then drape them in colors that are better and show them how a, a nip or tuck to the garment can change how they look. And I could never imagine being able to do that online. But you know what? Now I just have them send me photos, both um, the head shots like you just saw for color and full body shots that we use for talking about what garment styles are going to be the best on everyone. And the really great thing about it is that always before, because either I had traveled to a different city to meet with a group of ladies, or they had flown in from all different places around the country to St. Louis, we really had no choice but to do it as an all day class. And it never really fully registered for me how much that was asking them in effect to be drinking out of a fire hydrant to absorb all this information, mm -hmm. about what colors and what color combinations and what silhouettes and garments and what kinds of style details and what kinds of fabric and how do you accessorize it and how do you store it in your closet and how do you build the mix and match into the into your wardrobe? All that stuff at once was leaving people overwhelmed. So now by breaking it up into four sessions a week apart, people can digest one little chunk of the information and then go back and, and implement it in their own wardrobe and figure out where they have questions and 
what it was that seemed so clear when I was saying it is still a question mark when they try to apply it. And by the end of four weeks, people are just really transforming how their closet feels. I got an email yesterday from a gal who wanted to um, engage another hour of one-on-one -on -one Zoom consulting to sort of put the finishing touches on her decisions of which patterns and fabrics to go forward with sewing for the next season. And she said, now I've now mastered my closet, a thing of beauty, if I do say so oh. myself. Um, and oh, she was God. amazed how little dollar investment it took. She dyed some things to new colors. She changed out buttons to silver to match her silver hair. And, and now she's ready to sew confidently into the future, knowing that she knows what's going to look good on her and she can plan what's going to work together. And it's, it is so unbelievably much easier to do that when you sew. My, my sewing yeah. clients, we're a lot happier than people who have to settle for what's available in retail. Right. So we'll have a link to your class um, in I the description of the YouTube version of this. Um, in case people want to learn more about picking the right colors, picking the right silhouettes, this book is also super helpful and a super great introduction to uh, Nancy's great wealth of knowledge. Um, I so appreciate you coming on with me today and explaining all of this. Um, I've learned a lot. I think that our warm and cool color tone cards will be better going forward. And I think it's just been really helpful. And if, if you aren't sure if you're warm or cool, you can Number one, sign up for Nancy's class and learn more about it. And number two, just order both cards and see which colors speak to you and which ones you think would look great on you. So, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, thanks for watching, everyone. And I'll be back soon. And I encourage you to connect with Nancy online and learn more from her. Thanks so much, and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.